recalled from my last video, I decided that now was the time to start removing some of the clutter from this engine. So, you know what that means. So it always been my intention to remove most of the evaporation systems and secondary air intake and all that other stuff off of this. Partly because I'm missing some of it and partly because I just don't have room for it in the car. For example, these pipes here, I've already removed the actual pump, which is down here. This, this kind of wants to sit here, there like that. And it sticks out quite far out the front. So. There's no clearance for it, therefore it has to come off. And my intention was to kind of remove these things after the car had its engine fitted, but I think now is probably as good a time as any. So one of the things I noticed when I was trying to fit this manifold was that this line here is different because this, this is part of the EVAP system that goes to the throttle body on the other manifold the throttles on this side so it would plug into the top there but it's here now so this is actually different turns out i don't actually need this thing because i'll be removing the evap system anyway uh, this hard line here goes to the evap system this is actually a coolant line that goes to the overflow bottle on the micro it's on this side and as far as i'm concerned it's not going to move from there so if I do decide that it needs to go on the other side then I suppose I could just run a soft line or just a, a custom hard line that goes across there but this is this hits the fuel injector on this side here so it needs to go and whilst the engine is out of the car for a second time I'm going to prematurely remove the rest of the secondary air intake system, including the combi valve, which is here. I don't have the plug for it yet, but I have to remove these coolant pipes to get to it. So I may as well remove it now whilst it's out of the car and easy to access. And I'm also going to remove what's left of the vacuum system as well. So this is a small uh, vacuum chamber, it holds vacuum when the engine's off. Uh, it's all part of the it's the N249 system, which all sits under here. Yeah, with this manifold, none of this fits properly, so I have to remove it. Okay, so what is the N249? The N249 is just another name for the diverter valve control solenoid. And its main job, if you were to sort of distill it down into one sentence, is to allow the ECU to control the diverter valve independently from the state of the vacuum inside of the intake manifold. All a diverter valve does is it just stops charged air from going back through the intake after you let off the throttle and surging the compressor wheel. Uh, it allows it to escape into either the atmosphere or in our case it's back into the intake again before the turbo. Uh, and the reason you want that is because Despite how cool it sounds, compressor surge is bad for your turbo long term. So you have to remember that internal combustion engines suck air in. Uh, in normal aspiration, without a turbo, they suck air through the intake. And uh, even with a turbocharger, uh, under sort of light driving conditions, when you're not on boost, you are still driving under vacuum. There's no positive pressure. The engine is sucking air in. So when you close the throttle plate, Charged air can't get into the intake manifold, but the engine is still sucking the air out of the intake manifold into the engine. And that negative pressure, that vacuum it creates, is what then is what then goes to your diverter valve and opens it up. There's a problem with that, which I think Volkswagen tried to solve with the N249 system, and that is that it takes time for the engine to generate enough vacuum to open the diverter valve. Sometimes it doesn't generate enough vacuum at all. So what they did was they devised a system that allowed 
the engine to build up vacuum and then release it at a moment's notice, uh, usually when you let off the accelerator pedal, when you're changing gears or when you're just letting off. You don't have to wait for the uh, for the vacuum to build up, it's already there, ready to go. Uh, if you've ever seen that small vacuum chamber that sits on top of the valve cover, that's what that's for, that's a vacuum reservoir. Uh, the, the, the engine stores a bit of vacuum in there and the N249 uh, uses that vacuum to instantaneously open the diverter valve the millisecond you let off the throttle. In simple terms, all the N249 does is allow the ECU to open up the diverter valve before vacuum can be built up in the uh, in the intake manifold. All that basically means is that the diverter valve can open almost instantaneously after you lift off, or even beforehand, because the ECU also knows the position of your throttle pedal, right? Because it uses that to control the throttle valve itself. The N249 can also be used as a failsafe. So if the uh, the N75, which is the solenoid that controls the wastegate actuator, if that fails to open for some reason, uh, then the N249 can be uh, can be recruited to let off any charged air before it reaches the intake uh, to allow the ECU to control boost through another means. All right, so this pipe here, traced it all the way down through this soft line, down through there, along here, then it goes up, and then it comes out down here, and then it goes straight into the turbo inlet, right there. So we can safely remove that, we just need to make sure we plug it off. the evap system out i've removed the removed the hard line from the front along with the two check valves i've also removed it from the turbo side and I, i've left this big bunch of hard lines here because there's other stuff attached to it so the next we're going to remove the n249 system which is part of the uh, the recirculation system Once you've removed the N249, how do you control the diverter valve? Well, you do it the way that they used to do it, which is you take a vacuum source from the manifold and you plug it straight into the top of the diverter valve. So basically it's an old school method of opening the diverter valve. There's no electronic control, there's no failsafe involved, it is just using, it's just completely using uh, just the laws of physics to open the thing. Uh, for better or for worse, it is certainly a more simple system. Um, I wouldn't say it's less prone to failure. Uh, I think that really depends on the diverter valve and how reliable it is and how stiff the spring is, I suppose. 
Right, now let's talk about the N112 system or the secondary air intake system. It's all part of the same thing. The secondary air intake includes that big pump that sits on the front of the engine. Uh, and if you've seen those corrugated plastic tubes that are running all over the place, those are the air feed from that pump. So it takes, uh, it takes air from the air box, takes it down into the pump, and then the pump sends it back up into the engine again. And that's where it meets the combi valve. And the combi valve is basically just a valve that sits on the side of the engine um, and allows the air to enter the exhaust stream. And that's controlled by the N112 solenoid, uh, which itself gets a vacuum from the N249 system. They, they seem to be connected. Um, so by removing one, you're kind of crippling the other. But the premise in which this works is that it allows fresh air to enter the exhaust stream, which heats it up. Because when you cold start, uh, the catalytic converter is still cold and when it's cold it doesn't really work it has a certain range of of operation it needs to be at a certain temperature for it to actually work effectively so what the secondary secondary air intake does is blast fresh air into the exhaust stream heats it up and allows the catalytic converter to get it to a nice toasty temperature so it can do its job the system only works for the first minute or so after you start the engine from cold. After that, it's basically doing nothing. It's just dead weight hanging off the front of your engine. Clearly, Volkswagen put it there for a reason because they, they clearly care about emissions. <laughs> basically, if you remove the system and your MOT tester allows the car to completely cool down before doing the emissions test, then you're gonna want that system to be in place. But if you do what I do and give it the old Italian tune-up on the way, um, it's probably not even really worth keeping. So, so not only do I not have enough room in front of the engine for it to sit, again, radiator clearance, um, I just don't really see any benefit to it once the car is actually running. It's just dead weight at that point. So it can come off. When you remove the combi valve, it leaves a hole in the side of the block, so you need to uh, install a blanking plate. You can get these for about 10, 15 pounds, but, um, or you could probably just make one yourself, actually. I'm just gonna buy one because I can't be bothered with having to make sure the O-ring is correct and all that stuff, just buy one off the shelf. Uh, for the cost of them, it's just, it's just really such a small expense in the grand scheme of things. <laughs> million metal tires later and we are here pretty much all of the evap system in fact all of it's gone uh, the n249's gone the n112 is gone the secondary air intake combi valve that's now gone it's all in that pile over there uh, n75 has been left alone we're leaving all of that alone uh, this would normally go to the wastegate actuator but i've removed that for now uh, but this is all staying as it is what we do need to do is take a line from here to the manifold when the manifold's back on and that will allow us to open this recirc valve when it's needed. This is where the crankcase ventilation goes normally. Uh, so this is this is broken anyway. So uh, what we're going to do here is uh, is just put a catch can 
there and it's also going to connect up to here. So I think now what I'm going to do is since the engine's out of the bay and I have access to it all around I'm going to give it just a bit of a quick clean up with some degreaser. Uh, since I've already done this side over here, it makes sense to just do as much as I can now and uh, we'll see how that looks. That's a bit better. It's by no means super clean, but up until the point where I give it a proper dress up later on, this is much better than it was before. Uh, I've cleaned up the valve cover mostly, cleaned all the, all the uh, coil packs. Um, I've also cleaned the face behind here. Yeah, a bit cleaner. So now I don't have to have a shower whenever I come within a metre of it. Uh, I haven't touched the rest of the engine, it's still pretty grubby down here, uh, but I just ran out of time. Did remove a few more brackets that I didn't think I'd need, one of them being this uh, bracket that was on here. That just holds the cover on. I don't have the cover and I don't think I'm going to run one. There's also one attached to here, I've removed that too. Um, there are various other brackets, like this one down here, uh, this here as well. Um, I'm hesitant to remove those in case something I need clips onto those, but we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. So there we have it. I think you'll agree that this is a massive improvement over what was there before, and I'm certainly not going to miss those horrible plastic tubes, so that can get in the bin for sure. With all the physical systems removed from the engine, now we just need to keep the ECU happy. What some people do is they use resistors or other hacks to try and keep the ECU from throwing check engine lights because those systems are no longer there. There is certainly a cost element involved here, but it's a price I'm willing to pay if it means that by removing the system entirely I can simplify the wiring later on as well. In fact, just as I was recording the voiceover to finish this episode off, my ECU came back. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this more technical episode. I realise it probably doesn't make an awful lot of sense, me talking about and praising a system and then just removing it from my engine anyway. The actual reason I removed the engine in the first place was so that I could start making engine mounts. So my next episode is going to be covering that. So if you're not subscribed, please subscribe so that you don't miss that. For updates outside of the channel, you can follow me on Instagram, cg10.uk. If you like the video, press the button. And in the meantime, I will see you in the next one. Thank you.